David was a man after God's own heart. He wrote 72 of these Psalms. He was a harpist, a singer, a composer, a, a leader, a genius, any way you look at it, from a shepherd boy to taking care of Goliath, how he handled Saul when he was seeking to kill him for years, his whole manner in which he got to the kingdom. Sometimes sit down and read 2 Chronicles chapter number one through chapter number 19. First of all, you'll be astounded at the culture, the polygamy, the immorality that went on. But in and through this, you have David trying to be a little remnant, hopefully for God, but in the process when he should have been out fighting the war, he looked over the balcony and, and the window shade was up, right? Then the scandal with Bathsheba, then the cover-up and leading to her husband Uriah being virtually murdered as he commanded he go to the front of the line to, in the attack that they, he would command. Then the long, long time in which he buried all this in his heart until Nathan went there and said, he didn't say, thou art the man, David, you're the one who sinned. He said with tears in his eye, he looked at his king and courageous said, David, you're the one who's in trouble with God. And that led to wonderful repentance, public and private. We'll deal with that Psalm later on. David penned it. But then after all of this, we have to look and see what kind of father was David. With all the giftedness, what kind of father was David? Now, mind you, he was forgiven of his sin, but when we are forgiven of our sin, it doesn't mean that we have sown and we have reaped and we're forgiven of that evil seed that we did sow, but that doesn't mean there's not consequences. I could get into a fight, which I started, and I was wrong in the fight, and in the fight, I would get an eye put out. I'd go to God, I'd ask those I fought to forgive me. I would clean up everything, but I still would live the rest of my life with one eye, right? Because of what I did. This is David. Nathan said, David, you're forgiven by God, but the sword will never leave your family. Nathan said, you're going to have problem with your kids from this day forward. And this is what we see here. Exactly what was going on. Quickly, I'll tell you this story. Some of us know it. It's all built around Absalom. Absalom was perhaps the one who would illogically have followed David as king. His mother was royalty. David was royalty. Absalom was handsome. He, he had hair, beautiful hair, a great physique, charisma, a leader of people. We won't go there, but his hair got him in trouble. You know, two or four people have read that part of the Bible. But Absalom got in trouble because he was the son of a father, David, who was passive. What happened? Long story made short. Amnon, son of David, raped his sister Tamar. Absalom thought his dad, the king, would do something about it. Said David was angry, but he didn't do anything. Time went on until Absalom himself killed his brother. Oh, not directly. He got somebody else to do it. Now, you ask the question, where did, where did Amnon, the one who killed, who raped his sister, get all the lust? It's in the family, isn't it? From his dad. Where in the world did Absalom get the idea he could kill his brother? Oh, not directly through somebody else. Through David. He took care of Uriah, not directly, but commanded it. You see how this passes through 
And then when Absalom went into exile, he wanted to come home. David finally let him come home, but he went two years. David would not even look at his son, his wayward son, who was trying to come back. And when finally he looked into his face, he sort of pushed into one side and Absalom began to start a revolution against his dad. A lot of bitterness happens in conflicts, but there can be no deeper bitterness when your son or daughter revolts and vows to overthrow the dad and therefore the kingdom. You know what Absalom did? He did what a lot of people do. David made a lot of decision. He decided for one team and Absalom would show up and say, you know, if I'd been king, I'd have decided for you. I, I wouldn't have gone the way daddy did. And he did this all over the kingdom. And Absalom, when he went back, he rode in a chariot. He had soldiers walking on with him. He acted like a king. He performed like a king. And David, he did nothing. He did nothing with rape. He did nothing with murder with his kids. He did nothing when the egomaniac of Absalom began to explain itself until finally Absalom had gone all around all the tribes and all of Israel, and now he had his army, his group, and they were ready. Most of the young people to throw away David, who still had, I'm sure in the eyes of the modern youth of that day, as is today, what's this God and, and synagogue all about anyway? What a way to rule a nation. If I were king, if I were king, if I were king. And now the revolution took place and David was stunned. He was in his house, made out of cedar, luxurious, larger than even the temple, which was yet to be, would be incidentally. It's an interesting. Solomon built it, but... <laughs> The house of David Solomon was bigger than the church that they built. What about that? The synagogue that they built. And so now the clarion call, Hebron, 25 miles of Jerusalem. Here's Absalom with now armies gathered from all over Israel. It was a coup d'etat. A coup d'etat is a sudden, violent overthrow of generally the king of the president of the prime minister. It's not a typical revolution. It can breed into a revolution, but get the king out and hey, you've got him. So Absalom and all of his armies went after David and David stunned, took his group and fled, fled from his house, went down from Jerusalem, down through the Kidron Valley, up over the Mount of Beatitudes and he was running for his life. And the Bible said he was barefooted I've walked that very path. I tell you, it's not a good place to go barefooted. And he covered his face. He was crying, broken, unbelief. He, he was stunned. This king who was so active in his family, he responded to a crisis by nothing, 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 and nothing. And here he is, finally, he looks around and some of his people are bringing bringing along the Ark of the Covenant. So kind of the literal presence of God in their eyes. And, and that's what they did. When Israel went to battle, they'd bring the Ark. They'd take God out with them, right out in front. And David, with great wisdom, in the middle of all of his family stupidity and complacency, he said, take the Ark back up to Zion. Put it there in the synagogue where it belongs. It doesn't go with me. God may not be with him. I don't know. Put the ark back up there. And now here are thousands marshaled to kill the king, to destroy all of his followers, and everybody's turned against David. You read it there. Shimei was there, a family that was loyal to him. They was, he was cursing David, saying, you're a man of blood. Man, you don't have any chance. But Phibosheth, who was the son of Saul, that David had reinstated his table, he and his family all turned against him. Family, friends, soldiers, enemy people, those he'd honored, they all now turned on David and David is running with a little bit of his family and, and his faithful men and they go down and down and down for their life and now they are bedded down. 
Perhaps 48 hours later, David finally goes through a restless sleep. And then Joab, I think he was there. Oh, Joab's loyal commander-in-chief, general of the army, what a guy. Joab wakes up and looks over there at David, who'd gone to sleep under the stars. Maybe he hadn't done that since he was a shepherd or he was running from Saul. Or he'd gone to sleep under the stars, barefooted, crying, broken. He sees David picking up and writing something writing something, and David sort of smiled. Now they're surrounded by a thousand, thousands of people doing everything they can to kill him in David's life, and David's writing something. And let me show you what he has written. Look on the screen. Look on the screen. I'm going to read the first verse and the dark areas if you'd read in a responsive way. I'll read first. Lord how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifting up, lifter up of my head. I laid me down and slept. I'll wait for the Lord to sustain me. Arise, O Lord, and save thee, my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies. Upon the cheekbone thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Let me outline that for you. Verse 1 and verse 2 is a cry of hopelessness. Remember the situation. Verse 3 and verse 4 are a cry of faith. Verse 5 and verse 6 are a cry of confidence. Verse 7 and verse 8 is a battle cry. Let's look at it, exegete it, and see how relevant that is for you and for me if we're under any kind of wave in your family, in your business, in your health, in relationship with your children, in relationship with the world, in all the wokeism we're living under. Let's see if this gives us any answers. The first, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. <laughs> Is that true where David was when he penned these words? Many they are be which, be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah, by the way, Selah, remember, it says something about music. It says probably there's a crescendo when this is sung there in the tabernacle. Also, it means, what do you think of that? Isn't that good? Here we are, bottoms fall out. He feels hopeless, helpless. And they say, David, you're such an immoral, rascal, adulterer, murderer, a crook, sorry leader. Let me tell you something. Even God is not interested in helping you. You have had it. Verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 3. But thou, O Lord, wherever we are as a nation, wherever we are individually, wherever we are as a family, that's the whole thing. But thou, 
O Lord. You see the word Lord there. Yahweh or Jehovah. It means a covenant. It means that in all of this mistakes, the mountains and the valleys that David had experienced, he still had a relationship with God. But thou, O Lord, I'm bottomed out. There's no hope. Even they say, God can't help me. Oh, but I know better. But thou, O Lord, a relationship with God in Jesus Christ, folks. You know how you can tell when somebody is really a Christian? It's when the bottom falls out of their life because of mistakes, because of sin, because of poor choices. If they just run and excuse and stay in the far country and go on and on and on and on and on, and they sort of tip God, but they don't get broken and come back in shame and repentance. If they do that, they know they still have a relationship with thou, O Lord. That's how you can tell. That's how you can tell. I've just read, I don't know if it's accurate or not, I can't imagine it, that 88% of the Senate and House of the United States are Christians. If that were microscopically true, wow! What a beautiful position we'd be in in America, would we not? But you see, somehow it's easy to have the name and go through the motions and not have thou, oh Lord, who run my, Lord, run my life, thou you're in charge. I make my life, my decision on basis of biblical truth. And David, even with the wave coming, thousands all around him, He's lost virtually everything. He says, thou, O Lord, he turns back home to God. Then the rest of it, thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. And the word shield there in the Hebrew means a shield that went all the way around him. In other words, I've not only got your front, the Lord says, David knows I've also got your back. Man, he needed that because he'd been tricked and people had turned on him. You're a shield for me. My glory. You know what my glory is? That's David David saying his righteousness. Well, he didn't have a lot of righteousness. Oh, yes, he did. He'd repented. He'd got it right. He said, my righteousness, my glory, and the lifter up my head. You can look in a lot of directions when you're down, but if you lift up your head, that's toward God. And he said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah, what do you think about that? The ark was taken back on Zion. Now he looked up to God, and he looked beyond the ark all the way to heaven. And he said, God heard me. First two verses, hopeless, three and four, Words of faith, but thou, Lord. Do you have but thou, whatever's going on in your life? But thou, Lord, but thou, Lord. Is that operative with you? Is it, and when, when we're just bottomed out, there's no light, and we seem confused. Listen, you keep all your eyes on that which is wrong, that which is broken. All you have to do is look up to God, and you see He's still running this world and he wants to run your life and my life 24 seven. But thou, O Lord. And then look at five and six. Here we have confidence. It's a cry of confidence. I laid me down and slept. I awakened the Lord sustained me. Can you imagine? There are five or six or seven or 10,000 people two hills away waiting to come and kill you and eliminate everything you have in your life and you went down and took a, took a nap. You slept all night long. That's called trust, isn't it? Boy, I've had to rely on that many times. When I forget, I have to go back to it. I laid me down and slept. I awakened. The Lord sustained me because of thou, O Lord. He said, I will not be afraid of 10,000 people 
who have set themselves against me round about. The shield covered him round about, all around him to those who would take his life. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. And he lay down and slept, and the Lord sustained him. And then we read a battle cry. Arise, O Lord. Do you see the battle that's here, the shield? Uh, We're going to see the brokenness here. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies with the cheekbone, and thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. In other words, he knew that the victory belonged to God, not from him. He had bottomed out. He'd been the nothing, nothing man with his family and now he is going to be something with this family of God. And he said, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. And then he turned away from himself. He said, thy blessings is upon thy people. Not just those who are still pro-David, but also those who are pro-Absalom. What a song for you and for me, for our nation, for this time, And we are in a battle, ladies and gentlemen, for the heart and soul and minds of our nation and of our families. The number one problem in America today is passive fathers, AWOL fathers, look at it throughout history. Almost every major crisis we face would beginning to be healed and solved if we would have dads, fathers who'd be godly men and would not be passive, passive when challenges and crisis come to the family. You know the story, David's army, the people rallied around him They defeated Absalom's revolution, his coup d'etat. Absalom was fleeing and he caught his long hair on the branches. I guess he had one of those super cuts like we see now. I don't know. He caught his hair and he was dangling there and David had told everybody, don't kill my boy, save Absalom. I wanna, don't, don't kill him. But when Joab saw him there, he went over and they killed Absalom. When the news went back to David, David was back. In Jerusalem, everything had been reestablished. They told David, he went into mourning. And the classic words, he said, oh, my son, my son, my son, Absalom. Oh, my son, Absalom, would to God I had died for thee in your place. Oh, my son, Absalom. And he was broken and empty and defeated. The secret sins of a father and mother or a father tragically are so many times become shameful sins in their sons and in their daughters. Nothing can take the place in a child's life but a dad, but a dad. Dad, make sure in your life right now, you have a vow, oh Lord. 